Hello YouTube, my name is Nero and today we have some Call of Duty Ghosts in this week's episode of Dear Nero, which of course is the weekly series here on my channel where subscribers send me in fan mail and or fan questions, and I do my best to go ahead and answer them. For this week we have a pretty good assortment of questions here, not a ton of questions, but I think we got a pretty good assortment of questions nonetheless, so we're just going to hop right into it with the first question he's going to write, Dear Nero. For the rest of your life, you can only choose one of each category, so what will you choose? Which hero in Hearthstone, which gun in Call of Duty, which animal in Pokemon, which class of Battlefield, and which three things that you could eat? Keep up the great work from a longtime subscriber, Joe from New Zealand. So all the way down to New Zealand, jeez, that's a long ways away. Alright, so I have to bit so this is kind of like a favorites question, right? That kind of idea. So if I could only play one hero for the rest of my life in the Hearthstone, it would be the warrior. I like the warrior the most. Uh, which gun would I, uh, could I use in Call of Duty? The only gun I'll ever be able to use ever. Now, assuming, of course, I can pick any gun that's ever been in any Call of Duty, and I get to take that one gun with me in every Call of Duty game going forward, including Advanced Warfare, I am definitely going to choose the Thompson from World of War. Nice round drum Thompson. That's what I would use. Uh, which uh, animal in Pokemon? I guess which Pokemon in Pokemon? Um, uh, Bulbasaur is my favorite starter, I would say, but since I can only use one for, like, all eternity, I would suppose pose you'd pick Venusaur instead of regular Bulbasaur because of course Venusaur is much stronger. Maybe Mega Venusaur. Did I get a Mega Stone with this? You didn't specify. Uh, which class in Battlefield? Definitely Assault. I run Assault and that's basically the only class I really run in Battlefield for the most part. I like being the medic. I like giving people health and stuff. Uh, which three things I could eat? This is tough. Three things. So Shepherd's Pie is amazing. Definitely like that. That's going to be one. Ah... Uh, some kind of pasta, some, some, maybe, some maybe like a chicken alfredo or something, you know, so we got, so it's like mashed potatoes and beef and corn and vegetable stuff, but that's like what shepherd's pie is. Then you have like chicken alfredo, which is like, you know, bits of chicken, then like noodles and alfredo sauce, and what else would there be? There has to be something else. I want th these three things to be as different as possible. Uh, I guess pizza, right? Maybe, yeah, pizza. So pizza and chicken alfredo and shepherd's pie, I think would be the three things. So there, I answered all your questions. I, that was a kind of fun one. I think that was a cool one. Next question, he writes, Dear Nero, I was wondering, what would you think if Borderlands came out with an MMO? I personally would love it. Love the vids. Keep up. You inspire me and my channel, Douglas from Washington. So that's awesome. You like my channel enough that it inspires you, Mr. Douglas from Washington. But uh, the idea of a Borderlands MMO. So you, you look at what Destiny is, and Destiny in some ways, it's kind of like, it's like Halo and Borderlands kind of thrown together. But the idea of like a Borderlands MMO, it could be a fun idea, but I don't, I think it'd be tough to do. Because in Borderlands, traditionally, there's four Vault Hunters. And because of the four Vault Hunters, there's four total classes. Now, if there's only four classes, then... You know, you see, you see the problem. There's not a lot there for an MMO. That's actually a problem that Elder Scrolls Online had. Was there just a severe lack in classes? There is the Templar. Oh God, it's been months since I played that game. There is the Templar, the Dragon Knight, the Mage. I think it's called Sorcerer instead. And then there's the oh, what is the other one? Nightblade. Nightblade, kind of like the rogue character, would be the fourth one. There's only four classes to choose from in that game, and because of that, it kind of it kind of makes things feel kind of stale. Because that's that's honestly the problem I had with Elder Scrolls Online is there's only five options in your hotbar, and the reason is because they want to make it so this game works as well on just as well as consoles as it does on a PC. Where you look at traditional PC MMOs, you know, your hotbar is freaking like 30 different buttons you can press, and everything's hotkeyed onto your keyboard, and you know it's quite it's quite a big deal. But in Elder Scrolls Online, there's only five. You can only have five things plus your ultimate uh, ability on your bar at once and because you're kind of limited in that respect i think the same thing would kind of happen in a borderlands mmo where you're kind of limited in what you can do because there's usually only four different classes you know the siren and uh, some kind of a tanky character be it the berserker or be it like create the psycho you know there's um i don't know there's four to six i suppose classes in borderlands i think because of that it could become kind of stale but aside from that i guess the idea of a borderlands mmo would work it would just be borderlands but with more people you look at the way the raid bosses are set up in borderlands too they're pretty powerful bosses but they are possible to be beaten with four people so in an mmo version they would have to make it so those bosses are a lot more difficult so as it's going to take you know 15 to 25 people i would say to be able to take down these bosses all of them using different things but i don't know the idea of a borderlands mmo could be fun but honestly though i think borderlands has like a lot of features of an mmo but it works well with just four people 
right? You just having four people on there, you and a couple buddies or whatever, you guys can go and try and do raid bosses. You guys can go and do the harder quests in the game. You guys can go do all that cool stuff, and you don't necessarily need to have the MMO aspects. The fun part, I guess, about an MMO is there's a bunch of other people throughout the world, and the world feels more alive, but you'll find that in a lot of MMOs, the world only feels alive in the main city. So let's say, for example, in Borderlands 2, if that was an MMO game, whether you know there's you know, hundreds of thousands of people ever playing that game, uh, the only the only place that's going to feel like it's actually an MMO and like it's actually alive would be Sanctuary, you know, the main city. That's the only place it would kind of feel alive because if you're out there questing and stuff, there's so much phasing involved in MMO games right now to kind of phase you in and out of different kind of quests and different cutscenes and stuff that you're not really in this kind of a live world. When you're out in the wilderness, you're going you're, you're gonna to find one or two people maybe out there. And aside from that, you really see nobody. But it's when you go to the main cities in MMO games that you actually see a lot of people. So uh, Borderlands MMO, of course, I would play it, but uh, I don't see there's a really a reason for them to do that because, you know, it's good the way it is. It's good the way it is. Next question, he writes, Dear Nero, what do you think of the first week of the NFL season? Sorry about the Browns, and do you think Ray Rice will ever play in the NFL again? Keep up the great work. Frank from New Jersey. So Frank, uh, the first week of the NFL season was pretty uneventful for me. I didn't actually watch any of the games because there was a get-together on Sunday at for my dad's side of the family, right, out at one of their camps. And because of that, you know, there's no cable out there. There's no service out there. It, I, I had to go because, you know, my dad's side of the family never does anything. I was able to see a lot of people that I haven't seen in a very long time, so that was nice. But the downside was I was not able to watch any of the football games for this week. So that kind of stinked the Browns. Uh, I think you actually get to watch the game. I got to see the highlights, of course, like on Sports Center and stuff. But, you know, they were down 27-3, to ended up coming back to tie it 27-27, then lost by a field goal as time expires. That sucks, but it's also kind of good because it's the Browns, and they're not used to doing things that are good. So the fact that they were even able to come back like that, kind of a little glimmer of hope. And Ray Rice. Do I think Ray Rice will ever play in the NFL again? I totally don't. Uh, ever since that video... Let me, let's go over Ray Rice real quick if you guys know what happened. So Ray Rice, a few months... I think it was a few months back, or maybe a few weeks. I'm not sure. It's hard to tell time. Uh, it was a while back. Ray Rice, there's a video of him pulling his unconscious girlfriend or fiance out of an elevator. All right, and a lot of people thought that he hit her, knocked her unconscious in the elevator, but there wasn't enough proof or anything. There's a lot of stories going around about it. No one really knew what happened inside of that elevator. Uh, the NFL ended up giving Ray Rice a two-game suspension, and that was that. Well, as of recently, another video has come out of, from inside the elevator where you know she, his fiance, starts pushing him, and then he you know, hits her with his left hand, knocks her out, knocks her on the floor, knocks her unconscious, all in one hit. And because that video came out instantly. The Baltimore Ravens, who Ray Rice is running back for the Baltimore Ravens, uh, they instantly cut him. The NFL indefinitely bans him from the NFL. Uh, Nike drops their sponsorship deal with him. EA Sports Madden removes Ray Rice from the game. And I think something else ended up happening. Like a, like a giant shitstorm just came down on Ray Rice after that video actually came out. Like, it was absurd. But here's the weird thing. And don't get this twisted. Do not twist this up, internet. Do not twist it. While it's not cool to hit women... Right? She was kind of pushing him a little bit. He hit her. And the entire idea of suspending him, like, just completely, like, blacklisting this guy from sports in general is kind of absurd to me. Because there's a lot of domestic violence disputes within the NFL and all of Major League Sports. All pro sports. There's stuff like this happens all the time. But since there's actually video of Ray Rice, he's actually, he's, he's just getting shitlisted for everything. Right? Just because there's video. I thought that was kind of weird. Just because, it's like... This, this kind of stuff happens quite a bit, not super frequently, of course, but it does happen off and on, and they never get as bad a punishment as what Ray Rice got, and the reason Ray Rice got this punishment was because there's actually video of it. I thought that was weird, but yeah, totally, I don't think Ray Rice is ever going to play in the NFL again. Next question, he writes, Dear Nero, Recently, PewDiePie, who is, if you guys know PewDiePie, is the biggest YouTuber out there right now. I think he's got like 30 million subscribers. He's a gaming channel. Recently, PewDiePie turned off comments on his videos. He turned off comments because he said the comment section was filled with spammers, haters, and self-promoters. I personally think he overreacted. I mean, no channel is perfect. I have seen channels with less than 5,000 subscribers have all the same things that he has in their comment section. So what do you think about PewDiePie doing this? Also, are you ever going to turn off your comments from Tim in California? So, Tim, I don't think he overreacted in the slightest. So, the comment section of someone's videos, especially someone that has 30 million subscribers, can be a daunting task. Here at my channel, things are great. 
you know, I, I honestly think I have one of the best comment sections on YouTube. You know, of course, when the video first comes out, uh, here's how it goes. When the video first comes out, there is, a, you know, the first comment. Then there's some other people thinking they were first, but they really weren't first. Then there's some people that say, oh, second, third. Then the douchebags come in, they're like, oh, fuck you, first, uh, you're dumb, uh, I, I hate people that write first. For no reason. Like, what's wrong with these people? Who cares if someone else was first? Why do you care so much that other people write first? It's not a big deal. All right, then that happens. Then after that, all the rest of the comments are, great job, Nero. I love you, Nero. Can you respond to this, Nero? Nero, you're awesome. I love you, Nero. You're so cool, Nero. Great video. So inspiring. You're awesome. My comments are great. Yeah, if I ever need a self-esteem boost, I just read the comments of my videos because you guys are like, hey, you guys are great. You know, you guys are always just so nice to me. But then there's, on, on occasion, there are, you know, annoying comments. And there are bad comments that people have. And what I do with my channel is, like, they're, they're so few and far between these bad comments that I either just, one, make fun of them, or two, I just block them. You know, that instantly removes the comment and that bans them from ever being able to, you know, comment on my channel again. That's how I do it. But if you look at someone like PewDiePie, it has 30 million subscribers, right? And yeah, like hundreds of thousands of comments on every single video. You take the situation that I just explained to you, and then you amplify that up to, you know, a hundred thousands of comments. You know, I get like 200 comments on my videos. You look at him where he's seen hundreds of thousands, right? You think of all those people, those people that on occasion, I like, they have a really annoying comment or they're, you know, a really rude comment or they're just being you know, rude to other people or they're just in their self-promoting, all that stuff that happens. That's amplified just so much on, on his channel that it might seem like that's all he seems to get. You know, I don't, I don't blame him for turning off his comments because there is a lot of self-promotion on my channel. But what's kind of cool about it is you guys in the comments, you guys like flag their comment for spam. And so like instantly like that comment just gets removed and it's pretty great. Like I don't really need to go ahead and remove it. You guys all flag it for spam and then it puts it into a folder where I get to go review them and then I just delete them all from there, you know. Uh, I think that works out pretty well. I like that system. But with someone like PewDiePie, it's getting so many comments that they just it can't keep up their subscribers can't keep up with that thing they can't flag them off for spam so when he does look at his comments for actual feedback towards the videos his videos take a long time to put together all of them are just like you know either hating on them or you know just some kind of people arguing with each other having rude like people just being rude or people self-promoting and it was just kind of a cesspool and to be perfectly honest i don't i don't blame him for wanting to turn off his comments you know it's kind of hard to you know, if you go to Twitter, which is that's what I think it's what he's doing right now, is he's actually making it so people can use like a hashtag on Twitter or something like that uh, if they want to specifically comment on a video. If you go to an outside source like Twitter or Reddit or Facebook or something like that, and you have people comment on the videos there, then those people are actually going to be the people you want to have feedback from. You know, any Dingleberry can write a comment, but someone, you know, that if they actually enjoy the video enough or they actually have some constructive criticism on the video, that they're willing to go to a place like Twitter or they're willing to go to a place like Facebook or Reddit. And and try and get in touch with you there then those people their feedback actually matters because they're willing to go to the next step so i don't blame them there's actually a bunch of youtubers that have turned off their comments i remember a while back uh, a lot of youtubers turned off their comments when the new google plus system came in and they claimed like oh it's because you know people can link you know viruses and you know s jumpers or screamers whatever that one thing was or they can just do a bunch of horrible things writing swastikas with little art in uh, the comments and they said they turn it off because of that but a big reason a lot of youtubers turn off their comments is because their comments are cesspools you know that and, and that really speaks to how youtube's comment system works when the biggest youtuber their biggest partner doesn't want to use their comment system so i think it really speaks to youtube they should do something to try and make comments a bit less spammy and yeah i don't know what the they would do that but i definitely don't blame him for turning off his comments i don't blame all the other youtubers that turn off their comments will i ever turn off mine uh probably not at least not right now, because my comments are great. I love it. But if, you know, hypothetically, if I were to have 30 million subscribers, then maybe I would consider that as an option. So maybe we'll have to see. Next question, he writes, Dear Nero, I broke my arm the other day. I was wondering if you've ever broken a bone. Jackson from North Carolina. So Jackson, I've never actually full on broken a bone, say broke my arm or uh, broke my wrist or broke my leg or anything like that. I've never actually broken a bone, but I have like cracked my head open several times and had a bunch of other really random injuries. I think one of these ones is a pretty interesting story, and I think I'm going to go with it. I think I've said it before, but I'm going to go with this story regardless. So, at the town I used to live in, all right, there was a fire hall. And behind this fire hall, I'm not sure what they were doing. They might have had some construction there recently or what, but there was a giant dirt pile back there, and a lot of people, it was a really small town, a lot of people, like kids my age and stuff, we were all kind of into BMX biking, and even some of the older guys, you know, the people that were, you know, between 
between 15 and 18. You know, they were also into BMX biking. So they actually set up, like, plywood on this pile of dirt to make it kind of a, kind of a ramp and a jump. I'm 9 or 10 at this point. It's like 1999 to early 2000, somewhere in there. And at the time, the style was that baggy pants, right? You look at you look at the style now, it's kind of styled to have, you know, pants that fit. And it's kind of styled to have, you know, pants that are either skinny or fit, right? It, people don't really wear that much baggy pants, at least, you know, not as much as they did back in the 90s and early 2000s. But it was the 90s and early 2000s, so I was wearing my baggy pants. I take my bike, little 9 or 10 year old me, and I go and I hit this jump. And my pants, being baggy, get, end up getting caught in my chain of my bike, which was awful. Because while I'm in the air, I, I kind of get scared because this is my first time ever like hitting a jump. And I'm in the air, I get scared, and... I end up messing it up. I end up like flipping forward and you know, I hit my head off the tire and off the handlebars and I try to like bail myself off my bike, but I can't do it because I'm physically like strapped to the bike because my pants got caught in the chain of my bike and it's like, oh no. And so I end up, you know, hitting my head off stuff and we end up wrecking and I end up you know, like rolling a bit and the bike's going with me because I'm attached to the damn thing and it was a big ordeal. You know, all in all, I hit, I hit my head off of a couple things, including the handlebars, like the tire. Uh, and I ended up busting my head open, so there's like blood coming out of my head. I ended up pulling some muscles in my legs because I like almost went over the handlebars. But keep in mind, I can't go over the handlebars at this point because I'm attached to my bike chain. So <laughs> I ended up like pulling some muscles in my leg, and you know, it was horrible. But like I said, it was behind the fire hall. So I'm taking my bloody self with pulled muscles and stuff. I, I, can't, I walk up there pushing my bike to the fire hall, and it just so happened to be bingo night at the fire hall. I knock on the door, and a person like opens up the door. And and she's like, oh my god, she's like horrified because there's like this 9 or 10 year old me sitting there with blood going down my face like, can I have help please? <laughs> and she rushes and gets like an EMT and like there just so happen to be EMTs there because, you know, there's not a lot to do in that town. So uh, everyone shows up for bingo night. And yeah, that was kind of an ordeal. They thought I had a concussion. They said I should have went to like... Uh, like the, the hospital that night, but I convinced my mom not to go to the hospital because I was afraid of the hospital, and I got to stay up late that night because I think I don't know much about concussions, but apparently you're not supposed to sleep after like getting a concussion. You're supposed to like wait a while before you sleep or something, otherwise it can like I don't know kill you or something. <laughs> so I ended up getting up to stay up late that night, and yeah, that was like the closest I ever had to breaking a bone, but I've never actually broken a bone in my life. Next question, he writes, "Dear Nero, how long does the process of video making take, and what are the steps?" Josh from England. So Josh, uh, video making, I, I suppose for your standard video, is not actually that long. It's the editing that really makes uh, videos take a long time. So here's your basic steps. Let's say you want to make, like, like, like this video. We're going to take this video, this Deer Nero, and I can, I, I can walk you through the steps of how I put together Deer Nero. So the first and foremost, you need to have gameplay. You know, and gameplay can sometimes be very quick. You can hop on and you can get like, some good games really quickly, or maybe sometimes you're having a bad day, you're having a bad couple days, and it takes you a while to get some decent gameplays. That can be a definitely a long process. But once you get your gameplays, now you're ready to start making your video. So first thing I do with Dear Nero is, you know, I wake up and I you know, open up my uh, messages folder here on YouTube, and I go through all the questions that were sent for Dear Nero that week, and I look through them all, and I decide, you know, what is an interesting questions, what are questions I haven't answered, answered a million times, you know, would be good questions to feature on the show, basically. And then I take all those questions, I copy and paste them into a text folder. Then I open up Audacity, which Audacity is a free uh, audio editing software. So if you guys, if you guys are YouTubers, you want Audacity, you can just download Audacity. It's free. Download it. It's great. And then I record myself answering all the questions. And I use Audacity mainly because there's a little bit of background noise in this room. And with Audacity, you can find that background noise. You can isolate it. And then you can remove all that background noise from the audio sample just right there in Audacity. It's a free program, too, and it's great. Then you export it and you make it an MP3 file. So it's pretty cool how that ends up working out. I like Audacity. But now that I've got my commentary all done, now I open up uh, my Sony Vegas, which is my video editing software. I uh, put in my intro. I put in the gameplay. I put in the uh, commentary and I edit down the commentary. I, I listen to the entirety of the video and I edit it as it goes because sometimes I mess up a question. Sometimes I misread a question or sometimes you know you have a random noise that happens. It's so annoying that happens. Like I'm gonna grab like this is my water bottle. Sometimes my water bottle will randomly like make that noise like where it pops or something for no reason. I'm like you son of a bitch. And I like, have to you know edit out that part and then re and like re-answer the question or you know I, I do the audio. It just did it. You heard? Do you guys hear that? It just did it. I hate when it does that. Um 
sometimes I have to edit, I edit out stuff like that. Of course, I'm not getting it for that part, but I edit out that stuff and then basically just put it together. It's not really that long of a process. You know, kind of just drag and drop video files, put in the audio files and edit that stuff. And then I render out the video. If you guys know what rendering is, because I talk about rendering on Twitter quite a bit or uh, uploading on Twitter quite a bit. Rendering is basically you take everything you put in your video editing software, like your audio, like your video, which is the gameplay, and your audio, which is like the commentary as well as the game audio. You take all that and you're able to put it together into one video. That's what it means by rendering. You take that entire everything you have in your video tracks and it renders them all together and makes a video that's what rendering is and so that can take quite a bit dear nero depending on the length of it can take anywhere from half hour to two hours depending on the quality of the video the uh, render settings i'm using and you know of course it's what i'm doing with the video but it can take quite a bit to render and then you have to upload it which uh, can take a long time if you have a bad upload speed, which I do because my local uh, internet provider is ass and there's no other option. So that can take quite a bit. But the process of video making really changes video to video. You know, while while Dear Nero, the longest part, honestly, about it is getting the gameplay and uh, rendering and uploading it. Uh, there's other videos, like when I did my top 10 uh, maps in Call of Duty, that thing took for freaking ever to edit. Which I like though, because I did so much like prep work and research going into every single one of the maps and all the choices I made. And then I did so much in editing to try and show off all the different intricacies of the maps and stuff. I think I might somewhere, I really hope I do. If, if, if it doesn't show up in the video, then I couldn't find it. But I think I might somewhere still have a screenshot of what my Sony Vegas file looked like when I was editing together the top 10 maps. It was kind of absurd. So some videos can take a long time to edit, and there's other videos that are like Dear Nero, which I guess I can put a screenshot right here of this week's Dear Nero, that really doesn't take a whole lot of editing to put in there. So, I don't know. It really depends on the video, but yeah, YouTube, uh, it's fun. I like YouTube. Lots of stuff. Lots of creativity involved. That's the hard part about it, right? It, the process of video making, while it can be kind of easy to make videos and stuff, the hardest part is like someone like me that I don't do live commentary. You know, live commentary, it's entertaining to watch people do live commentary. I don't think I'm very good at it. Uh, I don't think it'd be very fun to watch me play Call of Duty live. You know, I just don't, I just don't think it'd be that great. You know, I'm just not a live commentary person. And as a result of that, all the videos that I make are post commentary. All of them, I have a set idea or something specifically I want to do with that video. And that's where all the, like, it sucks the creativity out of you. Like, I'm almost 1,300 videos in at this point, and the hardest part about YouTube, the video making is not hard. It's something I've done freaking thousands of videos. It's not hard to put together a video. The hardest part is coming up with something entertaining and being able to present it in a way that other people are actually going to find it entertaining. That's the hard part. Occasionally, you'll see days where it's like, oh, it's, you know, Tuesday, and Nero didn't post a video. That's kind of weird, or how? You know, usually Nero doesn't post on Sundays, but he didn't post on Monday either. It's just because sometimes I just don't have it. Like, I, I don't have that spark. I don't have that creativity. I was like, I have nothing. You know, I have nothing. And that's, like, I guess that's kind of the downside, I guess, to having 1,300 videos on this channel and, you know, another 600 on my Let's Play channel. It's like... Sometimes you it, you just don't feel creative. Sometimes you just don't have an idea. You're just like the you have a, you're you're just blank. You just go dry, and then you know, take a few days off or something like that. And then that you kind of get that creative juices flowing again, and you're able to come up with some new ideas and some new stuff and some new videos to make. Um, that's the that's the kind of thing with me. The process of video making for me, like my videos are never planned in ahead. They're never planned ahead. Whatever you see a video for me that day was what I came up with that morning. You know, uh, <laughs> which is kind of a bad thing. I think I should try and plan out my videos a bit more. There are some videos that are, of course, planned. There's Dear Nero that's planned. Of course, Come Strike Saturday's planned every week. And, of course, like, Top 10 stuff. Like, I'm always constantly writing down stuff and uh, thinking of different ideas for my Top 10 series, which I think the next one's going to be Kill Streaks. Of course, like, stuff like that is planned. But for the most part, most of the stuff I, I just come up with that day or I came up with the night before, and that's why I end up making that video. So that's how I do it. Of course, a lot of people do it differently, but that's how I do it. Next and final question he's going to write. Dear Nero, in your Black Ops 2 report card, you said that you did not like score streaks as much as kill streaks. What made you change your mind? Thanks, Liam from Australia. So, man, I'm actually, before we answer the question, I'm looking through like the people that sent them the questions here. We've got one from New Zealand, we've got one from Australia, one from England, one from like North Carolina and Louisiana and stuff. That, these people from all around the world sending in questions this week. Uh, okay, so my Black Ops 2 report card, a lot of you probably didn't see that video. It was a video where I, I do it every year where I basically give a report card to the, how that Call of Duty did that year. You know, I do a report card based upon like how the gun balance was, how the maps were, how the kill streaks were, how fun the game was. You know, I do a report card about every Call of Duty game, and I'm going to be doing one for Call of Duty Ghost here relatively soon. Maybe not right away, but, you know, Call of Duty Ghost still has a few months left in it. I'll be doing a report card of that game 
pretty soon. Now, in Black Ops 2's report card, I said I did not like score streaks as much as kill streaks, and the reason for that being, and you guys know I love score streaks, the reason I still to this day like kill streaks more than score streaks is because as of right now, from what we've seen from Black Ops 2, is there's no real good way for them to implement score streaks to make them work well in a free for all in a TDM environment. Score streaks are completely dependent upon playing an objective or being in an objective game mode. But when you're playing stuff like Team Deathmatch and Free for All, score streaks are a pain in the ass. What was it? What wasn't that UAV like before? I think they ended up like making the UAV cost less eventually. But I think originally, like a UAV was like a five kill streak with an assist or something like that in Team Deathmatch. Like it was kind of absurd just to get a simple UAV. I remember specifically like Search and Destroy, for example, in Black Ops 2. If you're using the score streak system, I'm playing Search and Destroy. I killed three people and planted the bomb in one round of Search and Destroy, and that wasn't enough for a UAV. It's like goodness gracious, you know they need. That's the downside of score streaks. While score streaks were great in things like domination and demolition or any objective game mode, hardpoint, anything you can think of, while they were great there, they really don't work that well in team deathmatch, search and destroy, and free for all. Like basically, like kill based game modes like that, you know. So I was wondering how they're going to work around that in Advanced Warfare. Of course, I'm excited for the idea of score streaks coming back because I primarily only play Domination and Objective-style game modes like that, you know. So I'm excited for score streaks to be coming back, but I'm wondering if they finally found a way to fix score streaks so that they actually work in Team Deathmatch, Free For All, and Search and Destroy. Because if you guys look back at Black Ops 2, they really didn't work out that well. And that's the reason I said in that video that I like kill streaks more than score streaks. I still think I kind of do to this day because, you know, kill streaks, it just get killed. You know, I don't know. It's kind of hard. It's kind of hard. I like score streaks and objective game modes, but I want kill streaks and non-objective game modes. It's it's a weird give and take. It's a weird give and take. I'm interested to see how they're going to be working around that in advanced warfare. Well, I hope you guys all enjoyed this week's episode of Dear Nero. And if you did, please be sure to leave a rating where you guys feel the video deserves. And of course, let me know in the comments if you guys did enjoy it, because I definitely like reading your guys' comments. Because like we talked earlier in the video, I have a pretty cool comment section compared to most YouTubers. But if you guys like to send in your guys' questions for next week's episode of Dear Nero, simply send me a personal message here on YouTube. And uh, basically how you do that, you guys want to send a message, you go to my YouTube channel, it's youtube.com slash cinema, you go to the about section, you go to the send message button, and the first thing you should write in your question is Dear Nero, and then write your question, right? Because that way, it's a lot easier for me to be able to follow and figure out which messages that are sent to me are actually for Dear Nero, which ones are not for Dear Nero, which ones are for, you know, Chem Strike Saturday, you know, whatever. It's a lot easier that way. So yeah, it's definitely easier. I hope you guys all enjoyed this video. And if you did, please be sure to leave a rating. I hope you guys all have a wonderful day.